become more and more like him. Does that make sense? So these last day stories are there to build up the, sorry, these Old Testament stories, some of the New Testament stories, are there to build up a picture of the last days. Now what I want to do today is look at two things that will take place in the last day, and then I want to look at how we ought to use music, because music is a tool, yes? Music is a tool, it's a weapon, yes? When used correctly, it becomes a weapon, yes? For good, and also for evil. Because the devil knows just how powerful music is. But I said, um, before I was in church, going to one of them foolish dance parties and whatever else, there were no words to any of the tunes, but they still moved me emotionally. Because the, the rhythm that you find in, in certain music, it, 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 it almost bypasses the, the conscious mind and plants certain emotions and feelings in the, in the subconscious that creates a mood. You know how someone will say, drop a tune and, and set the mood? That's what music does. It, 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 it's, it's almost like a, another language. That, that communicates to the soul. That's why it's so, so important to know how to wield it. Because it's like a sword. If you don't know how to use a sword correctly, you're going to hurt someone. You can defend with it, and you can also attack. We need to use it to defend. Defend what? Defend the truth. So Numbers 25 and Daniel chapter 3. I'm not going to go into any great detail. It's my intention to stimulate a desire in you to study these chapters for yourself. Applying that rule that I mentioned earlier, yes? Now that rule of interpretation can be summed up like this, and I've mentioned it before from up here on shore. The local and the literal become the worldwide and the spiritual. By that I mean what happens locally and literally in those Old Testament and some New Testament stories, Yes? You apply on a worldwide and a spiritual scale in the last days. Yes? So what happened in one place, you apply on a worldwide scale. And what happened literally there is spiritualized. Does that make sense? So the literal Jews become spiritual Jews. Literal Babylon becomes spiritual Babylon. And when you study the book of Revelation, you'll see references to Babylon. It's not referring to literal Babylon, but spiritual Babylon. And how to understand what happens in spiritual Babylon, you go back to literal Babylon. And it creates a picture. Does that make sense? Yeah. So literal Babylon helps you to understand spiritual Babylon. Literal Israel helps you to understand spiritual Israel. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's, there's a literal Nebuchadnezzar, a spiritual Nebuchadnezzar, a literal Chaldea, and a spiritual Chaldea, and so on and so forth. And it's all about applying that rule, looking at the identifying marks found in the Old Testament, and seeing who they apply to in these last days. Because that's what God does. He'll give you identifying marks. And you've got to search the scripture to see who fits, who fits the description. Yes? Does that make sense? That's why he gives identifying marks for the true church, the false church, and so on and so forth. If you don't know the identifying marks, when you're looking for a true, a true, the true church, are you going to succeed in finding it? You've got to know the truth, and that's why it's so important to hide the word in your heart, to study this book as your life depending on it, because it basically does. And that's who we neglect it. And I'm talking to myself more than anyone. We may have a study here and there and sit down after it feeling sweet as though we've done all that we have to do. But do you study this book as though your life depends on it? Are you hiding the word in your heart that you might not sin against God? Am I doing the same thing? We, some of us sadly, hopefully not any of us here, will not realise until it's too late how much of a blessing this book is and will ever be. Because this will be studied not just this side of the great controversy then, but also throughout eternity. Our study will be the plan of salvation and the mystery of godliness, which is Christ coming in human flesh and living out a life that is impossible for us to live, that we might also be able to live that impossible to live life by his grace. Okay, moving on swiftly. Do you know the story of Numbers 25? The Israelites have not long left Egypt, and it doesn't take them, but it takes them around 11 days to get to the Vale of Shittim on the borders of, of, of literal Canaan. Now, let me show you this, this map. You can see that map okay? Yeah. <coughs> There's Egypt. 
got there, you've got the Nile Delta there, you've got the River Nile there, and there is another part of Egypt. There you've got modern day Saudi Arabia. Israel, modern day Israel is up there, you've got Iraq and Iran and all those places that go over there. You can even go over there. Um, that's where the head is from, so they had to get from there to there. And it's about an 11 or 12 day journey, yes? 11 or 12 day journey. This is my time. So, they set out from a place called Goshen. That's where the Israelites were given. The place that the Israelites were given to live by Pharaoh in the days of Joseph, yes? They moved from Goshen to a place called Sukkot. That was a place where the Egyptian generals would, 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 would practice military maneuvers. Now, why did Moses put them there? Because 40 years he was prepared to be the next pharaoh. So he was aware of the strategic advantage of, of moving to this place so that he might organize the Israelites, ready for them to cross this barren landscape and eventually meet God at Mount Sinai. Yes? They traveled from Sukkot to a beach there on the Gulf of Aqaba, yes? Now, traditionally, they say that they crossed the Red Sea there. That's, that's something that was concocted later on, hundreds of years after even Christ was born and died, yeah? They cross the Red Sea from a beach that you can see here from Google Earth, and over the years, there was an ancient river there, and it deposited a lot of silt and sediment on the base of the Gulf of Aqaba, the lighter coloured blue there is actually an underwater bridge that was not too far below the surface of the Red Sea. So that when Moses, by the grace of God, parted the Red Sea, not much of the sea had to be parted, if that makes sense. It's very, very deep either side of that natural bridge. Yes? So they crossed there, and eventually they moved on to a mountain that is now in Saudi Arabia called Jebel El Law, or in English, the Mountain of the Law, yes? Now, if you go to that mountain today, you'll see that it has a blackened peak. Now, the Bible talks about the fire of God consuming the peak of the mountain when he spoke to the children of Israel, yes? So, from Goshen to Sukkot, to the beach there, over the Red Sea, and eventually after a short journey to Jebel El Law. Because remember when Moses was in Midian, and he saw the burning bush. And God says, go and get the people and bring them back to this mountain. Midian today is Saudi Arabia. Midian is in Egypt. So those who believe that Sinai is in Egypt are mistaken. And even when you look at the text that says, well, which describes God saying to Moses, bring the people back to Midian. Midian isn't Egypt and Egypt isn't Midian. So if you just read the text, you can see that... Um, in fact, let me just, I'll come back to that. They then had to move from Jebel El Lord up to Canaan, which also took them a few days. Now, Shittim was on the border of literal Canaan. There you've got where the, the fake Mount Sinai is. Shittim was on the border of ancient Canaan and ancient Moab. Now, all they had to do was cross the River Jordan over into the promised land, yes? But what does Numbers 25 describe happening? Numbers 25 describes the fact that Moabite women were moving freely among the camp of the Israelites, yes? And no one questioned their, their mingling. Now, who were the Moabites? Who is the father of the Moabites? Lot. Lot is the father of the Moabites. So the Moabites were related to Israel. Their worship was very similar to the worship of Israel, but had been infiltrated by paganism. So because the worship was very similar, the Israelites, to a certain degree, tolerated wrongly the Moabites. Yes? And when we read the story,